Okay, um, feel free to stop me for questions at any point um, if you have questions about things as they come up. Yeah. Otherwise, you'll have some time for general questions at the end. Um, so I'm going to talk about DKA uh, today and just a brief outline of what we're going to go through. We'll talk briefly about what exactly it is, we'll talk about how it happens, what the pathophysiology of it is, management, um, and then some of the more common and serious complications that we try to avoid when it comes to DKA. Um, so basically there are three aspects to the definition. One is hyperglycemia, defined as a glucose higher than 200. Acidosis, defined as a pH of less than 7.3, or a serum bicarb of less than 15. Um, and then finally, ketosis, uh, as defined by elevated urine or certain ketones. Um, just a little bit about the epidemiology of it. About 30% of children who are coming in with a new diagnosis of type 1 diabetes will have their initial presentation for that diagnosis. DKA, and about 10% of children who are presenting with a new diagnosis of type 2 will end up presenting DKA. Um, we commonly think about DKA in the setting of type 1, but it definitely can still happen in type 2 diabetics. Um, and as we're starting to see more type 2 diabetes in children and seeing type 2 diabetes at a younger age, we've been seeing more DKA in type 2 diabetics. Um, in children with known type 1 diabetes, their risk for going into an episode of DKA tends to be about 1 to 10 percent per patient per year. Um, and most commonly, these are triggered by uh, missed or inaccurate insulin dosing or infection, injury, or some other stressor. Um, and then the, the likelihood of, the, of which things have triggered it kind of vary with age, as uh, many of you may have seen. As you get into kind of the adolescent and teenage years, uh, infections and injuries become less common, and it's more about uh, ineffective or just missing their insulin altogether. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the pathophysiology. So essentially what happens in DKA is you have an effectively low serum insulin concentration relative to the concentration of glucagon and other counter-regulatory hormones. And I say effectively low because it can be either absolutely low, like in the setting of type 1 diabetes, where you have an inadequate production of insulin due to damage in your pancreatic beta cells, or you can have a resistance to insulin, which is what we see in type 2 diabetes. So your overall insulin level will be normal or high, but your cells aren't seeing it because they've developed this resistance to insulin. Either one has essentially the same effect in the setting of DKA. So what happens then with this low insulin concentration or low insulin responsiveness is you then get an excess glucose production. Uh, and you get decreased peripheral glucose uptake uh, because insulin is required for cells to bring glucose inside. Um, and then the low insulin concentrations also stimulate release of free fatty acids, and that's what fuels the ketogenesis. So essentially what happens is your body, without insulin or without an appropriate response to insulin, does not see normal circulating serum glucose levels. And so it reacts similar to a state of starvation. And so your body starts shunting its normal metabolic processes, which are primarily driven by glucose, to be driven by a breakdown of free fatty acids and proteins and other sources of energy. Um, one of the other issues that you see with the hyperglycemia is that it leads to glycosuria. And generally, around levels of 180 to 200 are where your kidney stops being able to process the excess glucose in the blood. So you start to spill glucose in the urine. As you spill glucose into the urine, it creates this osmotic diuresis. So the higher the concentration of glucose in the urine, the more water it pulls along with it. And uh, that causes dehydration, and that leads to the kind of compensatory polydipsia, which is one of the most common presenting signs. Rivero, 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 please return to the emergency room 24. Rivero, Rivera, Romero, please return to the emergency room 24. What is wrong with her? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
which is one of the most common presenting signs of DKA or diabetes in general. Um, the other issue with the osmotic diuresis is along with free water, it starts to pull electrolytes. Um, and so that's where you get into a lot of your electrolyte losses in the electrolyte derangements, which we'll talk about a little bit more. Uh, but a large portion of that comes from your airing losses. Um, in addition, uh, once you kind of start to get those electrolyte losses, particularly potassium, uh, you can develop intestinal ileus. That, along with acidosis and decreased perfusion, uh, leads to the abdominal pain and vomiting that we frequently see in these kids. So as you kind of have this ongoing dehydration and worsening acidosis, both of those things will trigger release of cortisol, catecholamines, and growth hormones. And so these are all of the uh, substances that are already being released in the setting of low insulin and this perceived or this inability to kind of process glucose. So as that worsens, you get an increased secretion of all of these hormones and everything kind of builds on itself. Um, with the increase, uh, you start to see the liver putting out more glucose. Uh, because it doesn't recognize that there's already an abundance of glucose in the body. Um, so that exacerbates the hyperglycemia. Um, it starts to lead to ketone production. Um, catecholamines themselves, so epinephrine, norepinephrine, those things increase breakdown of glycogen in order to release more glucose. They stimulate breakdown of fatty acids. That leads to increased ketones. And um, all of those things also inhibit insulin secretion. So you are kind of you're building on this cycle of increased catecholamines, more glucose into the body, less ability to respond to that glucose, more breakdown um, of your other fuels. Um, and then growth hormone does pretty much the same thing as all of these other things. And so this is kind of a schematic of this kind of cycle. Um, so it goes through, you know, what we've kind of touched on already. So you have, you know, in this case, an absolute insulin deficiency or an inability to process that insulin appropriately. You have some sort of stressor, infection, injury, or just a lack of administering insulin um, that kind of leads to the increase in all of these counter-regulatory hormones. Um, and you can kind of see what all of those lead to. So lipolysis, which leads to increased production and breakdown of free fatty acids. That's where you get your ketogenesis. You then develop ketoacidosis, um, and that can also progress to a lactic acidosis. Um, you have a decrease in your glucose utilization, uh, which, you know, as you can see there, leads to more hyperglycemia. Uh, you have an increase in the breakdown of your proteins, decrease in your synthesis of proteins. You create more uh, glycogen, breakdown glycogen. You, you know, are doing all of the things that you normally do to create more glucose into the bloodstream despite its presence. Um, and as you can see, kind of moving down the middle towards the bottom, all of those things lead to your spilling of glucose in the urine, this osmotic diuresis, uh, your dehydration, your loss of electrolytes, all of those lead to poor perfusion um, and get you into the trouble that we see all these kids uh, who are in when they're coming into DKA. Any questions about this, about how any of that's working? All right, so let's talk a, bit, a little bit about how these kids present. Um, so kind of the classic symptoms that are taught in terms of presenting with diabetes or DKA particularly uh, are the polyuria, which we talked about, the polydipsia, which is a compensatory mechanism for the degree of dehydration that these kids have. Polyphagia, which tends to happen kind of earlier in the process. Once you've kind of tipped over into DKA where you're uh, releasing all of these counter-regulatory hormones, generally you start to see more of the abdominal pain and nausea and vomiting. So kids who are coming into DKA have kind of passed that polyphagia phase, but you may get that in the history. Oh, they've been eating a ton for several weeks or months, but they've been losing weight despite that, and then now they don't want to eat anything and they're vomiting and they have abdominal pain. And then the kind of telltale classic physical signs that you're going to be looking for, um, you know, some of them really just signs of dehydration. So tachycardia, delayed cap refill, dry mucous membranes, poor skin turgor, 
um, and then some other things that are going to be more specific to DKA are going to be tachypnea and the small breathing um, and the free odor of breath, which comes from the acetone production. Um, one word of warning here is, you know, we commonly think of this constellation of symptoms and laboratory findings as kind of classic for DKA, but it's important to keep in mind uh, that not everything that looks like this is DKA. So you can have you can have hyperglycemia and acidosis that's not being driven by DKA. So in any sort of uh, significant stress, injury, infection, you have release of your catecholamines, which is going to increase. Uh, your glucose production, so you're going to see a hyperglycemia. And if you have malperfusion because of whatever your insult is, then you're going to have an acidosis. Um, and if you're dehydrated because you have, for example, distributive shock, uh, you haven't been fluid resuscitated, then you may also start to see ketones in your urine from that as well. Um, so it's important, as always, to remember good history, good physical, critical thinking, all of those things are paramount. Um, and as a matter of fact, we very recently had a kid who presented in essentially septic shock with ischemic bowel, but had ketones, had hyperglycemia, and was acidotic. People kind of narrowed in on that, oh, they need all of these criteria, this is DKA, let's treat them for DKA. Um, and it wasn't until kind of the next team the next morning came in and kind of reevaluated and said something wasn't right that we started to kind of veer in a different direction and pick up on what was actually going on. Um, so just important to remember that these are kind of classic signs and symptoms and lab findings, but they're not 100% specific. And so you have to always bear in mind what, what other things may be going on. All right, so now let's move towards management. Um, so as always, first thing you want to do, ABC, so airway, breathing, and circulation. And within the context of DKA, that's important because, you know, in general, you know, kids who come in tend to be pretty with it neurologically, but these kids can come, come in pretty lethargic and pretty attended. And so are they well enough to protect their airway? Are they maintaining adequate respiratory drive? Are they breathing? Um, and then circulation. So these kids are often pretty profoundly dehydrated, um, and so you can see compromise of circulation in that setting. So address all of these things uh, before you move on to anything else, as we should be doing always in every patient. Um, next up, access. So in general, we prefer two peripheral IVs. Um, one, so that we can provide adequate fluid resuscitation and administration. We have another line for drawing labs. Um, separate from fluid and insulin dextrose administration. Um, and then central venous lines are discouraged uh, due to a deep, an increased risk of thrombosis um, in the setting of DKA. Fluid management. So as I mentioned, these kids come in dehydrated um, and kind of, you know, anytime a patient comes in dehydrated, the first kind of response is, well, we should fluid resuscitate them. Um, and that's an appropriate response in the setting of DKA, but really we want to be very modest with our fluid resuscitation in the setting of DKA, um, because one of the things that we think may contribute to uh, a higher risk for cerebral edema is over aggressive fluid resuscitation and overly rapid shifts in osmolarity, uh, which you can see with aggressive fluid resuscitation. So in general, our approach is fluid resuscitate really to maintain hemodynamic stability. So if someone comes in and they're dehydrated and their volume depleted to the point where it's compromising their circulation, then by all means, fluid resuscitate them until you've kind of achieved that stability. In general, for most of our patients who come in in DKA, a single bolus of 10 or 20 per kilo should be sufficient to kind of make sure that they're stable and then move along with the rest of your fluid management. In general, the average patient with DKA who's coming in, you can estimate anywhere between 7 to 12% dehydration. Our goal beyond achieving hemodynamic stability is to correct that dehydration over a fairly long period of time, so 36 to 48 hours. Yeah. Oh. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead. I didn't raise my hand. I just said who is comment. Sorry. Uh, if you are giving them a bolus, what fluid would you choose? So, 
Generally, normal saline is probably the most common, but any of either normal saline, LR, or plasma light would be fine. Is there anything you have? No, I no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, as I said, your goal is to kind of replace this fluid deficit over 36 to 48 hours. If you do the math uh, based on that degree of dehydration and that period of uh, correction, it generally comes out to about one and a half times maintenance. Um, so we typically skip the math and just put everybody on one and a half times maintenance and then just follow that and see whether it's right or not. Um, in general, when we're uh, doing our kind of fluid replacement, we're starting with normal saline-based fluids. And part of the reason is we don't want to drop their sodium. We don't want to decrease their osmolarity in a rapid fashion because we're trying to avoid cerebral edema. Um, later in treatment, you may start to see some shift in what fluid we're using uh, because oftentimes as you continue to give large amounts of normal saline, you start to develop hyperchloremic acidosis, um, and that kind of delays your recovery and your transition. So sometimes you'll see people switch from normal saline to half normal saline, or from normal saline to some sort of acetate-containing uh, fluid. And there's actually fairly good data um, that shows there's not really any fundamental difference in terms of adverse outcomes between using normal saline and half normal saline from the get-go. Um, but I think most of us still feel more comfortable starting with normal saline and then adjusting um, as things change. Um, next uh, step in terms of management is going to be insulin. So we, in general, want to avoid insulin bolus, and we want to start just with this continuous infusion of insulin. And so the reasons behind that are, again, kind of go back to trying to avoid rapid correction and rapid shifts in osmolarity. Um, so with a fluid bolus, in general, you're going to start to drop the glucose concentration fairly significantly. And then in starting uh, a continuous insulin infusion, you'll start to see that. The risk of an insulin bolus is that you drop the glucose too much too early. Um, and so that's why we advise against it. In general, uh, our starting dose tends to be 0.1 units per kilo per hour. There are certain circumstances uh, where we may adjust that later on or where you may want to adjust that uh, from, the, from the beginning. What would those circumstances be, Dr. Gallagher? So there's not any kind of hard and fast rules. Uh, many people will do it for younger age children. So children either younger than five, some people draw a cutoff at younger than two, will kind of empirically start at 0.05. Someone who you're worried about correcting too quickly, you're worried about their mental status, and you don't want to shift things too quickly, you may kind of start empirically at 0.05 per kilo per hour. Um, or, for instance, someone who comes in and their glucose has already dropped significantly with a fluid bolus, and you're worried that you're going to drop them too quickly before you can get your dextrose containing fluids in line, and you may start at 0.05. Um, I already mentioned uh, that the glucose tends to fall fairly quickly up front. Um, and then as you kind of continue your management, you want a kind of measured approach to the decrease in your insulin. So generally, anything under a decrease of 100 in an hour is probably going to be safe. Once you start getting um, up over more than 100 in any given hour, then you may want to kind of revisit your therapy and make some adjustments. Um, important to keep in mind that the goal of insulin therapy is to resolve the ketosis and the acidosis. So the goal is not to bring the glucose down. Um, you're trying to shift the body's uh, energy source from fatty acids and ketones back to glucose. Um, as a result of that, you will drop the glucose concentration, but that's not your aim. And that's important to re remember because, in general, you're going to see your glucose correct before you see your acidosis correct. And so that's when we want to start thinking about, rather than decreasing our insulin, adding dextrose into our fluids. Um, and so that kind of leads into the next wing of our management. So in general, per our protocol, and probably most places around the country, uh, we put the cutoff at 250. So once the glucose gets down to 250 or less, um, then we're going to start adding dextrose into the fluids. And our standard tends to be a D10 solution. 
And when we get to that point, we employ uh, what is frequently called this two bag method for titration. With the idea being that we have two separate fluids that are exactly the same in terms of sodium chloride concentration, potassium chloride, and potassium phos, um, with the only difference being one has no dextrose and one has 10% dextrose. So that we can adjust between these two, two fluids and the only thing we're changing is the concentration of dextrose. We're not affecting any of the electrolyte concentrations. Um, and as for how you titrate, there's not really any set protocol or science or magic behind it. So you may see some degree of variability based on provider. And I apologize for that. <laughs> you may, you may. I don't want to speak from your experience, but I'm just saying. Uh, a common uh, range that people target for kind of maintenance uh, is anywhere from 150 to 250. Uh, one of the problems with that is that, as I mentioned, you're still going to be spilling glucose in your urine at those levels, so it's going to be a little bit harder to correct your dehydration because you're going to have this ongoing diuresis. So some people may shift to a somewhat lower target. Um, but just be in communication about what everyone's target is and how you want to adjust based on where you are within that target. Okay, and then management in terms of electrolytes. So a common thing that we talk about, uh, and probably the most important electrolyte in terms of uh, DKA is potassium. So in general, in patients who come in DKA, their total body potassium is low because they've been losing potassium through their urine, um, and oftentimes they've come in with a significant amount of emesis, they're losing potassium uh, through their vomit as well. Um, so their total pot body potassium is low. Despite that, we often see normal or actually high initial serum sodium values. And the reason for that is, in the setting of acidosis, potassium shifts from the intracellular space into the extracellular space. So your serum potassium is elevated despite an overall depletion of potassium. And that's important for a couple of reasons. One, uh, an elevated serum potassium, potassium still carries all of the risks that we think about even when your total body potassium is low. So if your serum potassium is high enough that it's going to affect your cardiac condition, it doesn't matter what your intracellular potassium is or is not, that's still gonna be a problem. The other thing to, to keep in mind is because of this, once you start to initiate the therapy for DKA, you're gonna potentially see very rapid decrease in your potassium values as uh, the introduction of in insulin and the correction of acidosis start to shift that potassium back into the intracellular space. Um, and because of that, we frequently give uh, these patients supplemental potassium. In general, we want to start that once their serum potassium has come down below 5. And so if they're starting out below 5, it's extremely unlikely that with the initiation of therapy, they're going to go high. So if they're starting out below 5, then we'll start out with kind of this normal basic fluid of normal saline with KCL and KFOS. Um, and then if they're starting out above 5, we'll start really with just normal saline and wait till they come down below before we switch over to those fluids. Um, hypophosphatemia is also common in DKA, and so that's why part of the component of the potassium repletion is KFOS um, in addition to the KCL. You also can see hypomagnesemia and hypocalcemia in the setting of DKA, but almost always these tend to be very mild and don't warrant any specific treatment. Bicarb, don't do it at all. <laughs> um, so I think that we have, in general, done a very good job of moving away from bicarb, and we really don't see it being given that often. Um, in the past, it was something that was frequently given up front, uh, with the logic being these patients are often profoundly acidotic, give bicarb, start to correct their acidosis. Unfortunately, what was shown was that administration of bicarb significantly increases risk for cerebral edema, so that's why we avoid it at all costs. Um, in general, your acidosis is going to correct with your normal therapy, your fluid administration, your insulin. Um, and also in general, 
almost never, I won't say never, but almost never, is the acidosis a primary driver in any issues of hemodynamic instability in these patients. Um, so correcting the acidosis uh, is not something that needs to be done quickly or quickly, almost always. Okay, and then monitoring. Uh, so moving forward, once we've kind of uh, done our fluid management, we're managing our dextrose, we're managing our insulin. Uh, these are the things we kind of want to continue to do. So on all these patients, we're doing hourly and early checks on them. And that's because we're trying to assess for any signs of cerebral edema, uh, which is the most important potential complication of DKA. Uh, we're doing hourly glucose checks. Another big uh, complication that we want to avoid is hypoglycemia. Um, and so that's why you want to have a very clear uh, conversation with whoever your other providers are in terms of what are our total glucose levels and what are we trying to achieve. Um, all these kids get continuous cardiorespiratory monitoring, strict eyes and O's. We want to make sure that we're correcting their dehydration, that we're uh, giving them enough fluids, um, and then serial blood gases to kind of follow our acidosis and our electrolyte corrections. Can you comment on the anion gap or not? Sure. Anything specific or just? No. What, how do you want us what, to be about? What is it? What, why yeah, what is it? How do you want us to be about? How do you want us to be Okay, so anion gap uh, is really just a measure of looking at the different ions uh, that we commonly measure. So particularly sodium, um, bicarbonate, chloride. And so what it is is um, the sodium minus the combination of your bicarb and your chloride. A normal anion gap is 12. Uh, in DKA, you're going to see what we call an anion gap metabolic acidosis. So you're going to have that number be much higher than 12 in these cases. And that's one of the measures that we look at when we're trying to decide whether the patient is ready to transition or not. Um, so that's kind of the basic gist of it. Depending on what source you look at, there are some uh, sources that will include potassium uh, in that gap. Uh, and so if that's the case, just know that your normal number is going to be higher. So that would be 16 as opposed to 12 uh, because the normal potassium generally around four. So you add your potassium, your sodium, and then you subtract your bicarb um, and your chloride. I think pretty universally we think of it without potassium and with a normal level being 12. But I can't promise you that everyone will. What do you guys generally feel is an acceptable number to start thinking about your questions? Generally 12, but, and I'll get to this a little bit later, there's some variability and there are a number of different values for correction of acidosis that you can use. It's not just an idea. Yeah, one more time. It's sodium minus, sodium minus bicarbonate chloride. Yep. Yes. Minus yeah. So basically you're positive minus your negative anions. Or ions. Yeah. Ions. <laughs> your cations minus your anions. <laughs> Okay, so let's talk uh, a little bit about the complications. So as I mentioned earlier, cerebral edema is kind of the number one big thing that we're worried about in all of these patients. It's the leading cause of mortality in DKA. Most cases of cerebral edema will present in the somewhere in the course of your treatment, and usually a few hours into your treatment. Um, but you may very well see uh, evidence of cerebral edema on presentation. And particularly in the kids who present more profoundly ill, you can see uh, evidence of early cerebral edema. And even beyond that, it's likely that most, if not all, patients in DKA are experiencing some degree of, at the very least, subclinical cerebral edema. Um, what are the risk factors? So, really, kind of the first three here higher BUN, lower PCO2 and greater acidosis on presentation are really just markers for severity of illness. So it's not that any one of those factors itself is contributing to the risk for cerebral edema, but they're really just markers for how severe your presentation is. And then the other things that are risk factors are rapid shifts in serum osmolarity um, and then bicarb administration. 
Um, and then there are some sources that will also list age as a risk factor, with younger patients being at higher risk, um, but that hasn't necessarily really been borne out in the data. Um, um, so what causes cerebral edema in UK patients? It's not exactly perfectly well understood. Um, it's likely multifactorial. Um, there is this presumption of what we call idiogenic osmoles. So the idea being that as you are kind of building up into and tipping into DKA, as we mentioned, your serum osmolarity is increasing and increasing. So one of the compensatory mechanisms is your body generates other substances that act as osmoles within the cells to kind of balance that osmolarity between your intracellular and your extracellular space. And so with the production of those osmoles, you start to pull some fluid back into the cells um, and that may contribute to edema. And then once you start to correct your serum osmolarity, if you correct that faster than the intracellular mechanisms have to get rid of those idiogenic osmoles, then you're going to start to pull more fluid intracellularly, and that's where you get cerebral edema. It's also possible that you get hypoperfusion in the setting of dehydration, um, and then once you kind of resuscitate, you get reperfusion. So this hypoperfusion, reperfusion in the brain can lead to injury and cerebral edema. And then there's also uh, some thought that there are actually direct effects of ketone bodies and other inflammatory cytokines that are released um, in this uh, that can contribute to edema in cells. Um, so how do we manage cerebral edema? So again, always going back to ABCs. So these are kids who, uh, depending on how significant the edema is and depending on how attended they are, they may not be able to protect their airway and you may need to intubate these kids. It's important though um, to remember that uh, intubation in a patient in DKA is, uh, well intubation and then moving forward with ventilation is a very risky proposal because as I'm sure you guys have seen, these kids come in and they are breathing their CO2 down oftentimes into single digits. And so it's very difficult for us with a ventilator to match that. And so if you're intubating someone for cerebral edema and you can't match their level of ventilation, then that relative hypoventilation is only going to contribute more to cerebral edema. So that is why you may see kids who very clearly have cerebral edema who we are avoiding intubating because as long as they're protecting their airway, they're going to do a better job in almost all cases of breathing down their CO2 than we can do so now. Um, and then other basics of cerebral edema and elevated ICP management, so positioning basic stuff, head of the bed 30 degrees, keeping the head midline, um, and then beyond that, osmotherapy, so specifically mannitol, and then plus or minus 3% of Um Other potential complications, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, so thromboses. Um, so hyperosmolarity can lead to a thrombophilic state, one, simply through the increased viscosity, viscosity of the blood itself, but then also due to endothelial damage and then release of prothrombotic agents. Um, so for that reason, we try to avoid uh, central lines um, in these patients, um, which sometimes can be tricky because these patients are not always the easiest to get and maintain access in. Um, but if at all possible, we try to get by with peripheral access. Um, and then rarely due to this increased thrombophilia, you can see cerebral thromboses um, and pulmonary emboli. Um, so important to, to think about, not only could cerebral edema be contributing to impairments in mental status, uh, but cerebral thrombosis could be contributing to that as well. Um, and then again, as I mentioned, hypoglycemia is another potential complication that we want to avoid. Um, and you know that's obviously just caused by us giving not enough dextrose in the setting of giving insulin. The treatment for that is pretty basic, just give more dextrose. Whether that's in the form of increased concentration in your fluids, increased volume of fluids, or if they're with it enough, you know, just give them oral dextrose, have them drink some juice. And stuff. Just a question after you're done. Um, there was a patient in the ICU this past this year and mm -hmm. was from cerebral edema. I wasn't there and I was trying to get, a, you know, I'm sure all these things happen, but 
what specifically happened to this patient to cause that? Were they a new onset? And then was it just a rapid shift? In, yeah, so what I, you've done with it? I don't, I mean, I vaguely remember okay. this case. I, I wasn't even sure if you were involved. aware of it, yeah. Uh, but uh, what I remember is that the kid probably came in already with a very significant degree of cerebral edema. Um, from before any therapy even started. So that in the setting of normal therapy, whether the initiation of therapy tipped him over or whether his kind of underlying cerebral edema just continued to progress, I don't know. Uh, but that's, I mean, that's definitely something that you can see even without treatment or even in the setting of otherwise appropriate treatment, you can get cerebral edema that will progress or herniation and death. Um, if untreated, and then sometimes even with treatment. Um, it's, you know, osmotherapy is not always enough <coughs> to kind of do that. Uh, um, okay, transitioning from continuous insulin to uh, subcutaneous insulin. Also, unfortunately, uh, there is not any hard and fast standardized when and how to do this. This varies uh, very much depending on provider and specifically uh, endocrinologists. And so oftentimes it's even out of our hands. Um, so if you ask us, we're probably just gonna defer. Uh, but some general guidelines are one, I mean, kind of universally, the patient has to be able to tolerate PO intake, right? Because the idea is that they're going to eat and drink, they're going to take in you know, whatever amount of dextrose they're going to take in through that, and you're going to adjust for that with your subcutaneous insulin. Um, and then the other kind of thing is, has their acidosis been corrected sufficiently? And so how you want to determine correction of acidosis can vary. Um, so you can look at absolute bicarb level, you can look at pH, you can look at base excess, you can look at anion gap. And these are kind of good starting points for what most people would consider to be corrected. So bicarb of 17 or higher, pH 7.3 or higher, base excess uh, less than or equal to 5, and an anion gap of 12 or less. Um, and so you can certainly make a case if any one of these are present and the patient's ready to eat, that they're ready to transition. Uh, there will be some uh, people who will ask for multiple of these criteria, if not all of them, to be met before they're ready to drink the Questions about that? You said, you said uh, the effect less than or equal to 5 but yeah. there it says negative 5 which is it? Uh, yes, that's what I mean. So, which, base which deficit one? of 5 or less or okay. an excess of negative yeah. 5. Okay, and then we have a minute uh, for a brief digression. Just something to mention to keep in mind um, is hyperglycemic hyperosmolar syndrome. So this is something that's kind of defined by extreme elevations in serum glucose and serum osmolarity um, in association with a relatively mild acidosis and ketosis. This is classically uh, thought to present more often in type 2 diabetes and more often on its own as kind of a distinct entity from DKA, but you can definitely see it in conjunction with DKA. Um, so it's important to kind of keep this in mind and think about as you're working through. And these patients tend to prevent, present with much more profound dehydration, much more significant electrolyte disturbances, and a much higher risk for clots. Um, they may also get rhabdo, and they can have this malignant hyperthermia-like syndrome where they have extremely high and difficult to control temperatures. Um, and HHS, uh, though it's much more rare, does tend to have a significantly higher mortality rate than DKA on its own. So an important thing to consider, we treat it a bit differently um, and requires generally uh, longer treatment. Uh, a, much more aggressive approach to fluid management and fluid resuscitation and electrolyte uh, replacement. Do they have a higher risk of cerebral edema? No. Surprisingly and not well understood, their risk for cerebral edema is extremely low. Hmm. Um, but they're at a high risk for other complications that increase the overall mortality. Like what? So clots, 
um, shock, um, all of those things. Okay, other questions? I have two diabetes. Uh, I don't know anything about it, bless me. Um, but we've had kids who have come from adult ERs that did not do well because they give them a bolus of insulin uh, and then they started our insulin drip and uh, by the time we got there they were herniating because they just didn't understand that you can't do that to hyperdiabetes. We've done a lot of education so I have that quite a while. But it's type 2 diabetes because you have insulin, you just have a resistance to insulin that it's okay and they don't have as many shifts or what. I don't so, I mean, you, a type 2 diabetic who presents a DKA has very similar risks, and, and your initial approach to managing their DKA should be the same as a type 1 diabetic. If they're asking that. Yeah. There uh, is some difference. You may see some difference in adult treatment and pediatric treatment of DKA, for one reason being adults have less of a risk for developing significant cerebral edema um, in DKA. And whether that's because there's less risk associated with type 2 diabetics, or there's something fundamental about them being involved. With type 1 diabetics, we see them kind of all ages in the ICU. Is there a general time frame age wise when you start seeing them more? In terms of when they. When they end up in our unit? When, <laughs> when there's a problem. A or, so. So, like, you know, first diagnosis yeah. age can range from, you know, as young as less than two years old right. into kind of the double digit ages. Um, in patients who are known diabetics who come in with DKA, you see that much more as they get older. One, because uh, it takes a little more effort to adjust their insulin regimen as they're growing and as their hormones are changing. And two, they're just not as up to the <laughs> So the, the peak age of type I work with in endocrinology and I use some research, but peaking for the onset of type 1 diabetes specifically in the in the peak age is the late school age, early adolescence. Oh. Um, but we do see that range. We can see them as young as six months. We've seen them as young as six months old, um, all the way up to you can even see adults getting type 1 diabetes. 50% of the cases of type 1 diabetes are diagnosed in people less than 18 years of age, um, which is still a very concentrated time. Um, but doing within that time, the, the most common is that late adolescent, early, or late school age, early adolescent. But we are seeing the age declining. Um, so we're seeing, as you probably all are seeing, the, the younger kids because of the autoimmune nature of the disease and seeing an increase in autoimmune diseases. Thank you. Keep answering. I'm going to shut up the stop the 